Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 47 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author, media and PR coach, copywriter, editor and proofreader, and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content, events and training platform providing success tips for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Kale Druin from Plant Based Foods, a distribution company in Brisbane, Australia. With a background in sales, Kale has worked for a variety of organisations. He ran a vegan cafe and grocery store for three years before moving into distribution three years ago. Through plant-based foods, he imports US products including Gardein, Tofurky and Match Meats, as well as working with local Australian brands such as Herbisaurus to get them into retailers. In this interview, Kale talks about the advantage for US product manufacturers of launching their products in Australia, what US product manufacturers need to know when considering distribution in Australia, the amount of capital a vegan business owner needs to get their products into retailers, the realities of trading terms and profit margins, why you should not become dependent on large supermarket chains to stock your products, the major mistake a retailer won't put up with which can destroy a food manufacturer, the importance of knowing your own strengths and why Kale recently fired himself as CEO of his company, and much more. Here's the interview with Kale Druin of Plant Based Foods. Hello, Kale. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so I'm really, really interested to talk to you today because, um, you know, you're a distributor, you tr- distribute um, American products here in Australia as well as local ones. So really looking forward to to digging into some some great stuff here. But first of all, let's kick off with what I ask everybody. And that is, why do you do what you do? Why do you run plant based foods? What's your why? Oh, okay. Um, I guess the why for me is um, we I saw a big gap in the market and I thought it was important that some of the best products that I saw um, from my experience were available in Australia. I thought that would make a big difference to sort of people changing the way they eat. And that's, um, yeah, that's basically, and from my background as sort of a business owner and a cafe owner, um, grocery store owner, I saw it as being very important that, that more sort of grocery stores and um, supermarkets around the country had, had the best products the world could offer. Um, in this space. Right. Wow. So how long did you run your cafe and grocery store? Uh, about before you... Three years. Oh, three years. Yeah. And how and then when did you have how long have you been in with in distribution? About three years as well. Three years as well, right. Yeah. So and it's interesting that you say that you saw a gap in the market. So was that that there weren't uh distributors or, uh, or enough distributors in Australia or there weren't specialist distributors yeah. sing on plant based? A bit of both of that. Um it was a lot there were some distributors that were um in the vegan the sort of plant based space. But they were, they were kind of, they were operating like a lot of vegan businesses do, sort of under a, under a bridge, I would say, um, sort of hidden away a little bit, um, not really in the mainstream. And um, and what okay. it meant is that the the quantities of products they were bringing into the country and um, the the quality of the different items weren't necessarily the best um, that were available. So what that meant is that the price point um, that was was so much higher than it should be, and it, it sort of. It, it pushed a lot of people out of that space. They they couldn't afford to to have more plant based meals because of just the the cost being prohibitive. Uh, that's an interesting one. That kind of leads into my next question is because I, I found that with a lot of, you know, vegan food um, makers, they found that, and especially, you know, if they're also organic and other uh, or fair trade, you know, or other ethically sourced or made, um, that can be quite, it, that can drive the price up and particularly because, you know, you're dealing in the smaller quantities. So what are your thoughts on how can vegan business owners deal with that challenge to to stay competitive and, like you say, to get those products into the stores and into the restaurants? Restaurants. It's hard. <laughs> is the, <laughs> is the, is the um, um, you have to buy large quantities. Um, one of the things with when we first started um, the distribution side of things, I was still actually owning the you know, the cafe and the grocery store, and um, uh, Tofurky was our first product. Um, and 
uh, that were currently being distributed in Australia by a smaller company that was buying air freighted pallets of um, product, um, bringing them into the country and charging. I think Tosoki standard sausages were being retailed for sort of seventeen, eighteen dollars a packet, and um, and it was just because of the, the volume that was that they were selling to specialty shops. They were only focusing on that sort of that market, which meant that they could only. And the amount of capital required to to, to buy entire containers is, is is huge, and you've got to take a big risk um, first up. And most people won't do that. Uh, we I, I bought the first container of tofurkey with no real plan of how to sell it. Um, it was it was sort of I, like I knew that this product would work, but I hadn't developed a plan yet on how we were going to get it out to the market. Um, I spent the first um, six months driving around in a refrigerated van just trying to sell products to people. I've been trying to convince them that, that vegan products were going to take off in Australia. And um, it, it took a while, but we got there. And um, But uh, for every 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 time that works, there's probably 10 times it doesn't work. So it's definitely tough. Um, and you have to have a lot of things go right. Yeah. So in terms of then getting products into retailers, um, what are some of the things that, or, you know, whether that's health food stores or speciality grocers or, or, you know, like IGA here in Australia or the big supermarket chains, I mean, what advice can you offer? How, how can they go about that? Be relentless is the, um, is the, uh, the only thing I can, it's the biggest tip I can give is, um, uh, never, never give up when you get told no, 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 and no over and over again. For the first year of plant-based foods, well, probably the first six months, we just got, we we were barely trading at all. Um, there was most supermarkets were wanting to buy two packets of of a product rather than rather than a carton, and we were packing things up in styrofoam boxes and shipping them around. Um, but then eventually, with perseverance, um, we convinced some of the bigger bigger IGA groups that this was the right way to go. And started showing them the evidence, all that sort of stuff, and they and and all it took was one large group to to believe um, that there was something to be done in this. It wasn't it wasn't about some sort of um, love of vegan products or the it was about money. Um, they yeah. we, showed, we, showed, <laughs> we we showed them that they could make a lot of money by doing this, and it would give them a point of difference that would set them apart from their competition. And the time. IGAs were uh, desperately afraid of, of Audi and Coles and Woolworths, and the only way that they could do, they can you can only you can only find so many different varieties of toilet paper to set yourself apart from the rest of the rest of the market. What vegan products and plant-based products allow IGAs and supermarkets to do is really have a point of difference, because uh, largely Coles, Woolworths, and Audi don't operate don't react very quickly to the market so we that's why our focus has been so much in the um in the independent market because of that we can we can really uh-huh. target that that desire of these supermarkets to um to to go after point of different things they want those big big percentage gains for sure, for sure. So that's kind of interesting that you say that because I, I know, like, for example, with, I, I won't name them or anything, but I know with, like, say, with Coles and Woolworths, mm. which are, it's for the UK listeners, that's the equivalent of, say, Tesco and Sainsbury's um, and I'm not sure what the equivalent is in the US, but really big supermarkets, I yeah. guess, Walmart, Walmart and places like, like that. that. Exactly. So um, that sometimes they can be a bit cheeky in some way in that they kind of squeeze the veg- like the vegan business owner uh, in terms of margins and things like that and I've even seen it happen sometimes uh, in Coles where they'll have a particular branded product and it'll be on the shelves for a little while and then suddenly it's gone but mm. Coles have got their own version yeah. out and I'm kind of like oh. Okay, so can you talk to anything around that, like well, just some of the challenges, I guess, around these big supermarkets and margins? Absolutely. Um, we've, um, we, um, and I don't think it's just vegan products. It's because the Coles and Woolies do that to everyone. Um, but the um, we've we've had a lot of experience with with Coles um, and Woolworths. Um, there's been very um, very challenging processes of um, trying to be ranged. We've come very close to being ranged with Coles before. Um, but the, the margin requirements and the marketing budgets they require you to invest in in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to, to range your products. Um, really? With, with, oh. roll, with roving, um, rolling discounts. Um, so it's one thing that um, 
I just wanted to highlight is that when when sort of when you see products, so different products like say fries, for example, that are on heavy discounts in Coles and Woolworths, uh, they, that discount is being provided by fries, um, not by Coles or Woolworths. So uh-huh. when when customers um when customers buy all their products during that time, most of the time the company isn't making any money during that period. Um, so and that's just a requirement of Coles and Woolworths that you have uh, probably bi monthly specials that are uh, at least to the point where you're sort of cutting your margins to the point where there's nothing left. Um, and and why do they do that? Like, is that just for them to make, like for Coles oh, and Wars or the big supermarkets to make money or is it to get people to buy more of the product because it's a newish product? Well, possibly, but it's more just a, they're, 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 they market themselves as the prices are down, down, down and they push that onto the, Onto the um, manufacturers to provide that down, down, down. They, they want to maintain their margins regardless, and um, right. they won't. Um, so they they push all that back onto the. I, I, like, there's very few occasions I would imagine where Coles actually contributes to a special in any way. Um, so, so it kind of begs the question of like how why? to get more vegan products in. And like, exactly like for a vegan business owner, right? it's like, you know, who's making a product, it's almost kind of like. It seems to be like a drill. Like in one sense, people go, "Yeah, I want my product in, you know, in all these big supermarkets because then, you know, it it gets to more people." But at the same time, if you're not making any money yeah. from it, it's like, why bother? Kind of thing. Well, you've really just got to be completely aware of that going in. Um, that's the, you've there's got to be enough margin in the products that you're selling to Coles and Woolworths so that you can factor in all the things that they want. So it it, it actually ends up pushing pricing up. Um, Coles will Coles will sell. Um, themselves on being the sort of lowest possible prices, but they're really like if anyone's smart and dealing with gold, the, the price that that lands to them is, is is going to be higher than it would have been without them. So if we were just selling to the independents without coals as a factor in the in the play, if we weren't wanting to sell to coals at some point, um, we would have to we we would the pricing would be lower. Oh, and that's I see. so they okay. they artificially increase the the price of the market, which is yeah, it's a I shame. See. So, right, right. So all right. So so in terms of fantastic I, is my message. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they've actually been really supportive of vegan products in general. They've they've there's one of the reasons why um, IGAs and stuff like that can lack vegan products and is because they can analyze their their purchasing history. In a more detailed way than Coles and Woolworths, I'm sure Coles and Woolworths have this information, but the way that their departments are set up, the departments fight with each other for, for market share within the supermarket. So oh. they can't, they don't look at data and say every time someone buys a vegan product, they buy fifty dollars worth of fruit and veg, um, which is a really big plus for a supermarket because oh, fruit and yeah. veg you have to turn over or there's a lot of waste. Um, so they love customers that can come in and um, and and do that. So that's it's a big plus, and that's we've we've sold that in a lot of ways when we when we sort of do things with IGAs. But really look at your data and 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 um, understand what your customers are doing. And, and even though this customer might buy uh, buy one packet of Gardein or Tofurky or something like that, they're buying a hundred dollars worth of fruit and veg at the same time. Exactly like I do every Friday. Mm. Like when I go into Coles, uh, you know, and then you know, and then I'll go and get say a fries, you know, rice and chia seed and whatever. But I've bought a whole load of other yeah. um, products as well. Yeah. I see. So now you mentioned I just wanted to go back on something you touched on when you said in order to be in those big supermarkets, and I'm guessing this is possibly the same for say UK and US supermarkets, but you mentioned something about having to like the supermarkets require you to have a certain budget to promote. Absolutely. And, yeah. and that's in the hundreds of thousands. Oh yes, um, depending on the product range, but it's it, it, you. You'd be lucky to have any change from a hundred thousand dollars to do their various promotional schedules, which involve in-store bunting. Um, you pay a certain amount to have radio announcements in store um, of your products. Um, oh. you, if you want to be in their catalogue, it's another thing. If you want to be on their online store, um, it's another payment um, upfront for that. So there's a, wow. it, there's, uh, Coles and Woolworths operate a lot differently than most countries in the world when it comes to this sort of stuff. It's a lot easier to range products um, elsewhere in the world than it is in Australia. And it's just oh, not, really? Just oh, that's free. useful to know because I, I was going to ask that about, you know, particularly for our American listeners, so for American companies wanting to come into Australia. So what are some of the things they need to take into account? Obviously, I'm guessing it's, that budget, as you've said, is one of them. It's been one of the hardest things with um, some of the brands we've been representing um, in Australia. 
is that they didn't quite understand how difficult it was. They, they, they initially couldn't understand why we hadn't got in Coles and Woolworths straight away. And um, our argument was um, that we need to be a business without them or we'll be a business dependent completely on them and they will do right. everything they can to, to, um, to, to take advantage of us. So there's, there's, uh, it's, there's almost no point in ranging your products in Coles and Woolworths until you have a functional business that can operate without them and you can say, say no. Got it. So they become a nice to have rather than a mu- yeah. essential. Yeah, which is interesting because I know Parna Chocolate um, have avoided going into uh, the bigger supermarkets and develop very good relationships with um, yeah with the independents, yeah. which Parna said on the podcast when I interviewed him. So that's an interesting. One. Okay, that's that's good to know. Well, just while we're on that topic, then on on the Americans, what else do Americans need to take into account uh, when if they're wanting to get that get their products here in Australia? So, for example, what are some of the benefits and and what, what what do they need to take into account? How do they go about it? The good thing it? about Australia is that, that, that it is a, it's a good testing ground. And that's why a lot of the brands that we've got into the country have come here often all launch products before they even launch them in the US um, because um, Australia is a good testing ground for, for, the, for the, their type of products. So the demographics are similar, all that sort of stuff. One of the things we've had to teach a lot of the brands from is, is the need to have a local social media presence that's managed by the local distribution company, not by an American company. Um, ah, right. They struggled. A lot of the companies struggled very quickly around that. They, they wanted control of the social media page, and it's one of the things that we sort of insist on when we take on a new brand, that we, we get a managed, self-managed page um, for, for Australia because um, it's been a vital way that we've grown, grown the brands in Australia. And, the, and a lot of... A lot of them need to realise as well that just because the brand is huge in the US doesn't mean that the Australian market know anything about it. There'll be a that's certain, a good point. That's a good point. There'll be a certain yeah. percentage of, of vegans in Australia that will know them, but we can't. You can't. You can't survive in the Australian market by just selling to vegans. Um, yeah, it needs to be selling to the mainstream and to, to develop a product in in a in the market. It's the same as developing it anywhere else. Um, it takes time. And, um, For sure. and there needs to be a certain amount of patience when it comes to comes to letting that letting that brand grow. You can spend a fortune and grow it really quickly, or you can do it organically, and it'll be more sort of, I don't know, robust. <laughs> Yeah, maybe more sustainable yeah. over the long term. Now, when you mentioned, Co, you said Australia is a good testing ground, but mm. why would they test in Australia when they could test locally? Because I'm guessing, obviously, shipping costs are going to be a lot more. So, I'm, can you just expand well, it's on that just a little? An bit? argument that we make to them really: <laughs> we get the brand, we get the brands early because we um, the it allows them to test the the, the, the response to their products um, in a market that is in the US, so they don't have to launch into all the sort of WalMarts and all that sort of stuff, and potentially have sort of this giant flop that, that cost them a fortune. Um, oh, I see. They gotcha. Can, they can test in a smaller market, but extrapolate out from that um, those results to the to the larger sort of American market. And generally, things work pretty well. Like the even the product lines, the product lines like Guardian that we're already selling in the US, the lines that they had as big selling lines have pretty much been the same in Australia. Um, oh, okay. There's been... Um, some pretty good symmetry between the two countries, which makes our job a little bit easier. We don't have to spend too much time um, uh, bringing in all sorts of different lines and then cutting them and putting other ones in and all that sort of stuff. But, um, Got it. Yeah. And I think as well, it's like, I mean, I know there's a thing about, you know, it being environmentally friendly to eat local, but I still think there's this thing of like, we somehow see products from the US or the UK and what have you when we're in Australia as uh, exotic. Do you know what I mean? And the same, like if you're based in the UK and the products from Australia or America, it's somehow, if they're from abroad, it's like somehow, oh, there's something exciting or, you know, a bit sexier about them because they're, they've are they come from overseas. Well, and it's, and it's a bit of a misnomer too, the, the whole shipping cost thing. Um, the mean, shipping sort of um, food miles, the, ship, the container ships that we ship things on are the largest container ships you can get. There, there's so much being moved. Um, the, the, the actual food miles that are added to that, most of the food miles are actually in the truck moving the stuff from the port to the, um, to the, oh, to the supermarket. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. So, That's a very good point. So there's, it, it makes very little difference the, whether it comes from, comes from local. What our rule is, we will buy local as long as the quality is better than what the same or better than what we what we what we're getting into the US and we we rarely get there. Like the the products, our main brands, um, the quality of 
of um of Gardein and Tofokia so far. Um above a lot of the local stuff already. Um so Yeah. And it's important these products are good. Like they often they'll be the first time that someone that's that's trying these types of products um first time they're trying these sort of products and it will affect the way they think about these products going forward. Um if they don't don't try anything else after that point, um if they have a good good experience the first time they might. <laughs> So. Exactly. That's a very good point. Just on that shipping cost then, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm just imagining, isn't it more, is it still more expensive though, for, for say an American company or a British company to have their products sold in Australia or is it just that the end cost is put onto the customer? Oh, it's definitely more expensive. Um, the, the, um, the, there's a ship, the shipping cost, it's more of a conversion mm-hmm. cost. Um, if we had some currency, um, the, the, the currency conversion is the main cost. Um, in selling things from the US and Australia, um, if if the dollar, the American dollar, is at parity or something like that with um, the Australian dollar, you'll see dramatic price drops in Australia on on products like Gardein. Um, the shipping cost is a factor in it, but mostly, well, there's, there's a couple other factors. Um, it's relabeling. Um, all our products have to be labeled with compliant labeling for Australia. Um, so the, there's a there's a embedded cost in every single product that we have to convert Fahrenheit to degrees, um, all this sort of stuff. That there's certain laws around labelling in Australia, there's even just the way that columns are set up um, for the nutritional panels. <laughs> um, right. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of barriers to entry when it comes to bringing products in and bringing them in correctly. Um, so there's, that's, that's, um, that, can, that can affect the price. For sure, for sure. And I think that's good to know because I know sometimes even just as a customer, mm. I know, you know, sometimes if I've gone to buy, you know, a particular brand or what have you, and it's almost like, yeah, like $20, mm. whereas, you know, for a local brand, it would literally be half or yeah. less. And I think it's kind of, it, it's frustrating. But then again, I suppose if we know this, then at least it's something that the business owner can explain to their clients that, that that's the case, I guess. Yeah, we're definitely um, the largely, largely importers or distributors from, of imported products aren't trying to gouge customers in any way. They're, they're really just dealing with the normal margins that get put on these types of products um, and the in the embedded cost of getting those products into the country. Got it. Now, you mentioned, I think, when we, we actually met um, in person recently at the Adelaide Vegan Festival, which was great, and I know you mentioned something which I thought was interesting. You said something about when, um, you know, a, a vegan business owner, a plant-based business owner wants to get their products into retailers, they actually need a lot of upfront capital because of the trading terms. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, that, well, there's two different parts of that. Um, there's a lot of costs on our side. Um, we we have to um we have to usually provide trading terms to a to an IGA. So there'll be by trading terms I mean there's a period between when the product is provided to the customer and when they pay for it. Um, most 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 IGAs are sort of at least thirty days end of month. Coles and Woolworths are sort of more in the sixty to ninety days end of month. So that's from the end of the invoice month to the time you know, thirty days or sixty days or ninety days after that. Um, what I mean from a product perspective, um, so new products um, um, that wish to be represented by us, um, we we sort of want trading terms from them as well to try to offset some of the costs on our, our side. So what manufacturers in Australia need to realise when, when they're contacting... Um, um, sorry, you've got a beep there for a little bit, so I'm going to call them in. Um, <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> um, um, what manufacturers need to realise um, when they're um, when they're approaching distributors is that there is uh, just because you've a, you've been able to manufacture some products and and sort of get them ready for the market, there is a there's a capital cost of of providing those products. So if your first order is is um, twenty thousand dollars to to the um, to the, um, the distributor and um, and then they order subsequently order sort of the same amount for the next three or four weeks. If you're on a 30-day end-of-month account with the distributor, there's going to be probably sixty thousand dollars worth of, of investment that you're going to have to make just in trading terms. So that that money will be be put aside. Will always be out on account. For, for want of a better way of expressing it, 
Well. I see what you mean. So basically, what they they make their product, they've got to come up with twenty thousand dollars worth of product. Yeah. Um, but they're going to be waiting to be paid, and they could be waiting up to up to sixty days. Well, no, more so, they, more so that that'll accumulate. So whatever they manufacture in that month um, will will never be pay, will will really never be paid for. So there'll always be that amount um, out out in account until the sort of say the deal finishes or something like that, and they get paid in full. But they'll uh-huh. always be in, they'll always be extended trading terms. So they just just manufacturers just need to be aware of that. There is there is there is a barrier to entry if you're going to go into into the largest sort of supermarkets IGAs. Um, that's sort of one of the um, one of the things to take into account. There is quite a bit of money required. Um, to to get things going. Oh, I'm glad you explained that because I think that really is important. I think particularly you know for smaller vegan business owners, you know whose products probably you know they've tested them and they're they're great products and think oh great everyone must must eat these you know or everyone must get these. But yeah. um, I think that's really important for them to know that that process and uh, and and that those costs because you know I, I wasn't aware of that either. So that's um, that's really interesting. I really appreciate you going into detail about that because I think that's really helpful for people to know. So I guess one of the questions I was going to ask and obviously. Um, working with a distributor like yourself is going to have its benefits rather than uh, you know a manufacturer dealing directly with the um, with the retailers. So talk to us a little bit about the benefits of using a distribution company such as yourself, sure. and what do you look for when you're going to take a product on? Okay, um, yeah, the the benefits of um, a distribution company is often uh, the big retail chains um, don't want to deal directly with um, with um, the manufacturer. Mainly because they don't have the the mechanism set up for dealing with them in a way that that makes sense. Um, there's uh, there's lots of paperwork. There's distribution channels. There's marketing budgets. There's all this sort of stuff that that becomes part of our daily sort of operations. Um, that uh, that means that a IGA and stuff and different companies like that would prefer to prefer to deal with a distribution company um, for getting their products to the to the to the retailers. And the reality is you're going to have to distribute the products in some way. So you're even either, either going to have to store your products in third party logistics warehouses and and manage that yourself and then manage all the accounts from all these different companies yourself. Um, or um, or hand deliver, which is which is what a lot of smaller <laughs> distribution manufacturers do at the start. They they, they yes. drive the stuff around to stores by themselves. But to take that leap to, to sort of national distribution, it's really impossible to do as a manufacturer. And, and as far as I'm concerned, manufacturers should be focusing on making new products and let yeah. distribution companies do it, do what they're, they're good at. And, exactly. and the reality is we don't actually distribute stuff ourselves either. We use third-party logistics warehouses for all the actual distribution. What, what our business is about is people. It's about customer support. It's about um, customer relationship management um, and marketing. And um, as far as the, the physical moving one product from here to there, we leave that to professionals as well. But you handle that for it, which is great because you take that pressure off them, like you say, so they focus on what they're doing. And, exactly. and I suppose by having someone that, say, you know, literally specialises in plant-based products is that you're their champion um, because, like you say, you're, you know, you're talking to the people, the retailers, and I guess so you're, you know, advocating and really talking about the benefits, whereas perhaps a regular distributor that's got all kinds of products may not do that. Absolutely. It's it's, it's one of the things that's a little bit unique about um, that vegan products um, in the market is that it's hard for a distribution company that is doing all kinds of different products to jump between those mindsets, um, to be able to go, to go into a retailer and sort of selling them whatever um, mainstream product they're selling and then say, well, vegan stuff is fantastic as well. Um, the, 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 um, the, the retailers tend to see through that very quickly. Um, and it's why we've sort of formed very good relationships with some of the bigger IGA groups around the fact that they, we are a go-to, um, company when it comes to vegan products and they can trust us that we'll, um, we'll give them accurate information when it comes to, um, comes to vegan, um, what's, what the market is looking for. And one of the things we've done to, to sort of reinforce that is, uh, make sure that we're not just recommending our own products. Um, the reality is that we're, we distribute some products, but there's tons of other products in the market that are really good. And if we were to, when asked the question, what what are the best products to range in our sort of newly formed vegan section, if we we told a an IGA para, ca, um, category manager 
um, that it's just our products, it would seem disingenuous and and it would be wrong. <laughs> so yeah. and it would and yeah. it would and it would and be a disservice to the customers. And I've always argued that it's about category growth, not sort of dominating the category. Um, nice. It's about making nice. sure that category gets bigger and bigger so that lots of people can fit in this. That's right. And actually, like, when I interviewed uh, Seth Tibbet from yep. Tofurky, he said that he said pretty much the same thing. He said it's the, the whole concept of a rising tide lifts all boats. Yep. So as the category grows, it's actually a win for everybody, which is great. Absolutely. So, yeah, excellent. And I guess, yeah, as well, it, it, like you said, it builds that trust so that, the you know, do you know what I mean? They know that they can come to you and get an honest answer rather than you just, yeah, hustling to get a particular product in. So, no, that's great. So what do you look for then? Say, you know, I'm a vegan business and I've just created, say, a new vegan cheese. Um, yeah. And I, I think, right, I'm, I've got the money or whatever you, I, I've got, I understand, you know, the money side of things yeah. and I, I've got that entry level requirement. What do you look for? Sure. We look for a, a point of difference in those products like something that the market doesn't already have um and we also there's a lot of just standard things um, um being able to manufacture enough products to supply to a big network of, of um, supermarkets um it's one of the first things that, that knocks over a lot of local manufacturers is they, they've they've been doing sort of part in uh, doing fairly well selling to their local health and health food stores um probably a couple stores around where they live and then they then they get an order for a couple pallets of stock, and suddenly realise they just can't make that many. Um, and that's and that's one of the things we've sort of we've learned the hard way and with some of our local um, manufacturers. And we make sure we sort of we're very clear with our manufacturers now that we we take on the, they really need to be ready to, to to sort of step up and and produce a lot of product um, because we, we can't have out of stocks. One of the one of the major things that we've we've tried to do is sort of dispel that sort of amateur myth around sort of vegan products where we we made sure we were distributing things to store to IGAs very quickly um, and through cold chain sort of controlled systems, all that sort of stuff. And IGAs will only put up a certain amount of time sort of empty shelves. And that's um that's that, that's sort of the biggest thing that can destroy a manufacturer uh, really early on. It's just not being able to make enough product. That's a really good point. Yeah, I'm glad you've raised that because you're right. You know, it's all very well supplying, like you say, to your local area or in a market stall or have you. But, yeah, going into these, um, you know, larger retailers with their systems and stuff um, is is a, a, a big thing. So I'm really glad. This is fantastic stuff. I'm learning heaps as well. So I'm sure this will be really good for, for everybody. So um, now I know that you also help to get products into restaurants and cafes yeah. as well as the, the retailers. Tell us a little bit about what some of the challenges are and things to take into account um, for vegan business owners who want to get their products into cafes and restaurants. Okay. okay. Um, uh, to be frank, we're we're sort of really learning in this market ourselves at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's it's been a it's been quite a new market for us, and um, it's been the major thing that we've done is providing things that are providing products that are very easy for um for for cafes and restaurants to 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 incorporate in their menu, making so that the barriers to entry aren't are low. Um, when there's when there's a product that requires all kinds of different Different sort of equipment and all that sort of stuff to to bring it to um to cook it and all that sort of stuff. It just turns people off straight away, and it means that you're only ever going to be able to sell to a specialised vegan business. Um, and the, sort of our goal in the food service space is to get into as many places as we possibly can. So provide products and uh, service that is easy, easy to easy to easy to use, and um and it's why we're starting to like. We're starting to branch out, doing things in hospitals, and um, we've even <laughs> potentially got something going on with the Queensland prison system um, coming up next year. Oh, wow. Um, wow! So there's, uh, I think the, the the sky's the limit when it comes to comes to food service. Um, we we certainly haven't got it totally discovered at this point, um, but it's an exciting space. We think it's probably the biggest growth space um, for for vegan products in the sort of coming years. 
Um, That's interesting because I know like in New York, for example, um, the chef, and I can't remember his name, um, from Mama Fuku, the restaurant yep. chain there, he's put the um, uh, Vic, the Impossible Burger, I think it is, like on, yep. on the menu at some of his um, uh, outlets, which I think is pretty exciting. And do you think we're going to see that happening here in Australia as yeah, well? Yeah, we will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a few burger places. I'm in Sydney already doing some, some of our sort of products, the match meat type products, making that sort of that really meat style burger and i think that's um that's exciting like the vegan vegan junk food sort of <laughs> sort of thing is, the, <laughs> is, the, is the, the thing that really grabs people's attention like the yeah. the um and it and it it means that you can take your friends and all that sort of stuff and it's not not some sort of confronting experience where you sort of have to have to explain all kinds of things it's it just it just makes things easy and that's exactly sort of, that's, you can all kind of join in and yeah, yeah it's it's, so. it's what we're all about and and the, the easier we can make it for people to, to make better choices, um, the better things will be. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now, we're in a, a bit of a, a vegan or vegan business plant-based revolution at the times, which means, I think we've touched on this, there's a lot of um, players in the arena, mm -hmm. uh, both ethical vegan brands and non-vegan run businesses that are cashing in basically on the trend. Yeah. So I'm curious, what advice do you have for plant-based businesses on how to stand out both, you know, within and outside the vegan business arena and the larger community and maintaining regular clients and customers? Are you talking about um, the uh, product or just businesses in general, just to stand out? Um, I guess for the for initially for products, so for yeah. say for food products, because we're seeing so much. I mean, that's where it's, the explosion's yeah. really happening. I mean, when I went vegan twenty years ago, there was like the vegan cheese was hideous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Whereas now, I mean, we've got just all these different brands. Like you're no longer the the vegan cheese or yeah. the vegan meat. Yeah. Um, so I guess because there's all this competition, like, and I know you talked about in order for you to take on a product, there's got to be a point of difference. So, yeah. can you give some examples of how can businesses that's go about? having those stand out absolutely well i think that the biggest thing is, is is realizing really knowing the market and knowing that the, there are other products in the market that are, that are probably doing things really well and if and there's uh, you're either going to be a lot cheaper if you've got to manufacture a product that's a lot cheaper than that product or a lot better um and that's that's it's as simple as that um, there's no point in really doing it if you're just going to make something that's the same or worse than the product that's already on the market and charge more for it. Um, you, you're not going to survive. It's, it, it's a harsh reality of, of that sort of stuff. And there's a lot. Manufacturing products is expensive. It takes a lot of research and development. Gardein spent years and years manufacturing their products. Um, it's why they're one of the best in the world. Um, and it... it it's it's going to take some time before Australian manufacturers get to that point, um, and it's it's yeah I, I can't I can't really sugarcoat it anymore. Than that you sort of it's it, there's no point in doing it unless you're doing a better job or you you've you've made something that's comparable but a lot cheaper. Got it. What about in terms of packaging? Yeah, is there any tips you can offer there on yeah, professional? To... Um, the, there's yeah. there's sort of one of the biggest dangers in um, vegan product manufacturing is companies that come from a market background. So they're just doing the Sunday markets and stuff like that and have a lot of customers coming up to their store and they think, um, gosh, we could do this. Um, and then they sort of use the, the packaging that they were using um, at the markets and, and, and bring it onto the, into, the, into, this, into the local health food shop. They do all right and they think, wow, we, we should be able to expand everywhere now. And they fall over very quickly. Um, it's one of the big things that we've done with some of the brands. There's some, uh, there's a great local brand, um, Herbosaurus, that we represent. I know, yeah, I know, Lisa. I love their um, sausage rolls. They're delicious. <laughs> when, they, when they first came to me, um, all they their packaging was was awful. <laughs> it was it was just, it just wasn't ready for supermarkets. Um, they would they would, they'd been doing pretty well at markets, and they'd been doing they'd been doing stuff in the sort of um, in health food shops, but their packaging just wasn't ready for the supermarkets, and and but they, they were full credit to them. They took on everything that I'd said and really they, they spared no expense and they went out there and got really nice packaging made that was ready for the, ready for the retail market. And they're, they're going to do really well because of the, Fantastic. Because of the fact yeah. that they, they recognized that they, they needed to take a leap. And it's what most entrepreneurs just do instinctively is take that leap. It's the, and if you don't have that desire 
to take that sort of leap of faith, you probably shouldn't do it because yeah, it's, it's just not yeah. going to happen. That's a good point. And I do like Herbisaurus's packaging. It's very colourful, which I like, which I think with food is, is a good thing, you know, because it sort of evokes yeah. uh, emotions and gets you salivating and what have you. So, well, even just barcodes. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah. The, one of the, <laughs> something is fundamental. The, the barcodes that work, um, you, you can fall over very quickly when you've sort of decided to print your own barcode and put it on the back of a the packet. There's, sort of, huh. there's, there's standards when it comes to barcodes and um, supermarkets just will resist you immediately. Um, if there's too much, uh, there's, if there's not enough space between the edge of the barcode and the and the and the packaging and all that sort of stuff, there's there's uh, it, it just it just won't be accepted. Wow! And this is all stuff that you help and advise yeah. and guide people on if you decide to take them on. That's right. Fantastic! Fantastic! What about the use of the word vegan? Um, you know, versus plant based, it's a big one. I ask everybody this, and everybody's got different um, perspectives. So, in your experience, both as a you know a cafe owner, come turned uh, distributor, what are your thoughts on the use of the word vegan on packaging, marketing, branding, etc.? Yeah, I think um, the uh, our American brands have sort of moved past it a little bit. They they like using plant based or sort of all that sort of stuff. Um, I think it's still a very powerful word in Australia, and it's um and it's plays a big role in marketing. Like I've had meetings with Coles and they've told me why isn't vegan right in the middle of this packaging. Really? Wow. Um because they, they they recognize that um that it's sort of it does it, it just it's a quick way to answer a bunch of questions. And um and that's that's what they've sort of they've um they liked about it. But I, I tend to personally use it interchangeably um depending on the person I'm talking to or the group that I'm talking to. Um Vegan is a big thing. Um, oh, better for you is actually the, is the thing being the, the the sort of phrase being used in um in the IGA world at the moment, and even in the Coles and Woolworths world. Um, and and vegan sort of falls under that, along with all the sort of other things that come along with that. So it's and what's that term? Oh, it's just it's it just basically means that uh, we get lumped into sort of health food, and um and that's why. Vegan is sort of seen as being default healthy, um, even if the products uh-huh. aren't necessarily that much. But well, they're, they're probably better than better than sort of yeah. than something else. <laughs> but um, it, and it's really good. We're we're able to ride that wave, and um, we get we get sort of better rangings in a lot of places just because of the fact that we they can they can tick off their sort of health food thing by by covering uh, vegan covers so many different categories. Cool. It's interesting you say that because I went to the Naturally Good, uh, yeah. which is like a trade expo in Sydney earlier this year. And I was surprised when I walked all the way around. There were so many companies, you know, using the word, brandishing the word vegan. Yep. I was really surprised. And, you know, I talked to some of them, some of them were the own and the owners weren't necessarily vegan themselves, but they recognized that, you know, this was a, a particular market and they weren't using plant based or anything. They were just quite proudly, you know, vegan, not even vegetarian, it was vegan. I was very pleasantly <laughs> surprised. So that's good to no, very good yeah, to know. Well, it's definitely um, the growth numbers that that IGAs are getting in the vegan products is 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 why they keep going back to them and why all these products, these companies are starting to do it. It's got nothing to do with some love of vegans. It's got to do with the, <laughs> the almighty dollar. <laughs> of course and it's interesting you said that because I'm curious then how, I mean do you see this because obviously you know the past two years we've seen a real yeah. uh, blitz in you know embracing of veganism and plant-based foods um, but you know uh, uh, I, I suppose um, is there a danger of them kind of seeing it as a fad like paleo for example or some of these little trends that come and go or do you think it's here for the long haul I think it's here for the long haul um, mainly because there's our market isn't necessarily vegan vegan, vegan numbers will keep growing um, but it's more meat producers um, are what's sustaining this market at the moment. It's what allowing all these products to come into the country. It's the people that are eating one or two less meat meals a week. Um, that's yeah. that's what that's what that's what funds um, all these wonderful products being imported into Australia. Um, Got it. And that's yeah. that's that's the exciting thing. And those people, if they had try a good product, and those products don't change their life in some way, like it doesn't make them sort of doesn't affect. Their, their identity. They will keep eating. They'll start eating more and more um, vegan products, and eventually they'll just be vegan. They won't even realise it. 
Um, well, that's what we want. And that's what I find interesting about someone like Josh Tetrick and um, Hampton's Creek, you know, uh, getting those products, getting the Just Mayo on the, the stores at Walmart mm. and at Target. Um, I mean, do you see that kind of, how soon can we expect to see that or kind Hampton of thing Creek. here? That's right. <laughs> uh, well, or just, you know, main, like vegan products there regularly, um, you know, at, at similar prices. Yep. Uh, do you know what I mean? like Really genuinely making them accessible. We are working on that sort of stuff a lot at the moment, and Hampton Creek is a big one. We'll, we'll, we'll be representing Hampton Creek in Australia um, probably early next year. Um, Fantastic. And the um, and we've got a cheese product coming shortly that will um, be price, price um Price comparable to um to dairy free dairy cheese. And it's not the potato of, one, is it? No, 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 not at all. This one's oh, from okay. France. And um, oh, lovely. Okay. So it'll be um yeah, it'll be sort of it'll be on par with um with dairy cheese in the on the supermarket shelves. Um, so right. that'll um that and, and I think that's important. Like the and and, it, and it's twofold that sort of thing is it, it's trying to get the cost of meat to go up as well, um which is which is likely to happen over the next little while. So we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Um, as, as the cost of oh, as the subsidies on meat sort of reduce and and um, the cost of production of meat um, re- um, goes up. Good, and we want some of those subsidies going into plant based businesses, well, which is what I've been advocating exactly. for. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> all for that. I think it's an important part of actually the we talk about um, talk about sort of animal activism and and business owners being a very important part of animal activism, but also lobbying, like like government lobbying is is a is a vital part of this. So companies like Animals Australia um, do a do an amazing job in in sort of in that side of things. Um, it's it's sort of it's it's so important that governments realise that um, things like food security aren't necessarily just maintained through subsidising the meat and dairy industry. Exactly, exactly. Now we touched just briefly while we're on the topic. You said Hampton Creek's coming here. Um, are we uh, are we going to expect to see the Beyond Burger from Beyond yeah, Meat and the Impossible Burger from Impossible yeah. Foods? That'll be Fantastic. that'll be sometime next year as well. Um, oh, lovely. There we go. It's a bit of breaking news for us. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. So there'll be um, so some wonderful talk, things coming to yeah. Australia. Yeah. It sounds like it. Oh, very exciting. I, as I say, I said to you in Adelaide, I'll be a taste tester. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's talk a little bit about your own business then. So when you actually started up plant-based food, so you'd already been running as a, a cafe and a, and a grocer, and then you started up as a, a distributor. Mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about um, some of, what, what some of your challenges were when you first started out and oh. how you've, you've overcome those. Yeah, well, they're, they're constantly overcoming challenges, I think, is the, is the, um, is the, the name of the game. Um, the, the major thing is capital. Um, the... the um, a distribution business is incredibly expensive to run, and um, and to bring in new brands when you um, cost an enormous amount of money to break a brand into a country. So, um, getting the right investors is 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 so important. Um, and we like, we have the first investor, major investor I got in the company was good at the start, but it has turned out to be sort of the wrong investor long term. So we're going through a, a huge restructure at the moment, and and bringing new investors into the business. Um, which is sort of more linked with um, with what we want to do, what we want to do in Australia, which is change the way people think about food. So, be a big distribution company that really, really sort of pushes pushes the sort of envelope. Um, and and it's so important to uh, it's with twenty twenty hindsight to sort of to to understand what your goals are really early on, and um, and be able to structure business and the investors and all that sort of stuff and around that. Um, largely, you just don't do that. Largely, you have to make some sort of change along the way, and um, and that and that involves a bit of pain. But if you don't make that change, you sort of you end up blowing up, and and, and nothing yeah, comes yeah. of it. Um, so and I suppose there's yeah, and there's the sort of pros and cons of investors. And I suppose being a distribution company, it's probably kind of necessary, I yeah. guess, to have investors. Yeah, it's, it, well, unless you're incredibly wealthy yourself. Um, there's no way you can do it without investors. Um, it's, there's, there's just such a large capital requirement all the time. Like a, a container of of, um, of um, any one of our products is sort of a quarter of a million dollars at any point. And, um, wow. And what do you mean? It's a quarter. Of, well, just explain that a bit. What just, do you mean? Just buying a, buying a container of products is a quarter of a million dollars. One container. Yeah, wow. one container of products. Yeah. 
Gosh, and then you've then got to get them into all the stores to, to make that that's back right. yeah. and make profit. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot of products, isn't it? Yeah, not to mention sort of, yeah, not to yeah, <laughs> it is. But um, it's the only way to bring get the prices at where they are in Australia is to buy that kind of volume. Um, um, so, uh, and you can be a very boutique distribution company and sort of do it yourself, drive around, dropping things off. But that's not what we want to do. Our, our, like our model is to be very big and, and eventually sort of float on the stock exchange um, in five years' time. Really? Wow. So that's, wow. And, and I think that's, that's uh, it's exciting to do that and it also means that we'll make some big changes in the way that the market sort of sees vegan vegetarian, vegan sort of plant-based foods. That's really exciting. And you're going to keep it, obviously, specifically on vegan plant-based Absolutely. foods. Yeah, that's very That's so important. exciting. Um, wow, wow. That's great. Because that was, that was actually my one of my final questions too, is what do you see <laughs> happening in the future? That's that's fantastic. I just, just wanted to quickly ask you, though, what skills have you, like from your previous jobs and careers, have been mm. useful in running this business? I know you mentioned the grocery store and the uh, and the cafe. What were you doing before that as well? Um, I have done a bunch of different jobs. Um, the, I've developed sort of sold wireless systems to hotels and backpackers and hostels. I, um, I was a... I was a, um, a field trainer, sort of a franchise development officer for um, Eagle Boys Pizza at one point. Um, so I think the, the main thing for me was just sales. Um, I'm, say, I was going to say, yeah, you're a salesman, yeah. Through and through. And the, the one thing to understand is your limitations is, the, is more so than the I, – like I've – the most recent thing I've done with sort of my company is to, is to um, sack myself um, from the role of, <laughs> role, role of, um, role of CEO. Um, mainly because ah. I'm I'm horrible at it. <laughs> um, I'm I'm a, I'm a good salesperson, but I'm as far as the management side of things go, I hate that. And so, what's and your job title now? My job title um, will be a national sales manager. Ah, oh, so even though it's your company, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And do you get someone else in to be the CEO? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we've got um, oh. we've got a, um, an operations a COO um, coming on board very shortly, and a, and a chairman. Um, but we'll we'll eventually hire a um, uh, in, a, in a year or so time, we'll, we'll hire a CEO, but it'll be a sort of very professional because um, um, going towards the process of um, of um, floating on the on the stock exchange, there's a lot of things that we need to get in place before that happens. So there's a sure, and that's been a steep learning curve for me. I went from went from sort of being a partnership, you know, cafe to sort of learning how how businesses are structured and realizing that I, as much as you try to hold on to it, this sort of this ideal of being the sort of the person in charge of everything, um, uh, letting go is actually nice as well, and realizing there's tons of people that are better qualified than you and can and allow you to focus on what you're good at. That's lovely. That's a really brilliant lesson, I think, to end on to understand your limitations and let go of that control. Because I think, particularly like when businesses are starting out, you know what I mean. You're kind of bootstrapping, so you're doing everything, and there is that temptation. Well, no one can do it as well as I do. But then there are things that you just, you know, you're not ideal at. And so I think it's really good to, you know, to get that message out that to be prepared to delegate because that's the way that your your business will grow. It's the only way it can grow, really. So I think. Well, that's the, a, the, the one thing. Yeah, our, the one. Sorry, um, just to, <laughs> sorry to cut you off. There. Um, the, <laughs> no, that's the, all one, right. the one thing with um, our, I don't want to give this sort of impression that we're sort of this um, well-functioning uh, business. We, we've grown very quickly as a business, and uh, the, uh, lacking structure in all sorts of different ways. So it's not to, the the um, the the major thing is to reflect on that and realize that there are the most businesses will, I think, um, get to a point where they'll they'll either have some self analysis and change, or they'll they'll just disappear. And the, it's so important that that if you want to survive, that you you do sit down and realise that this sort of you might be not in the right position. You might have you might have done all these things that sort of you would have done if you had wouldn't have done if you had sort of the knowledge you have now. But the the, the best thing you can do is sort of is is listen to the people that that um that have more insight and um, and take that on board and um, and move forward in a better way. Exactly. And I think a lot of people are going to be listening to this interview and, you know, to you sharing your insights and your learning curves. And I really appreciate your honesty and your generosity in sharing um, all of that, you know, because I think we're all on a, a learning curve and it's it's good to know that, you know, you've you've done that and you've you've been happy to share that. So thank you so much for, for joining me on the show, Kale. It's been absolutely fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
So that was Kale Druin of Plant Based Foods. You can find out more at plantbasedfoods.com.au. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 47. Now for our vegan business news roundup. Mainstream chefs in Canada are embracing the plant-based revolution and eliminating animal products from their diets, reports the Globe and Mail. Stephen Salm, owner of Toronto's newest vegan upscale restaurant Planter, watched Cowspiracy at the end of 2015, along with reading articles about the impact of animal agriculture on the environment, and changed his eating habits to be all plant-based. He told the newspaper, my performance across the board has increased. I'm thinking clearer and I'm sleeping better. Sam is also president of Chase Hospitality Group and he's changed the menus at the Chase Restaurant and Colette, a room next to the Thompson Hotel, from having only a few vegetarian options to be 25% animal free. So still a long way to go there, but it's a start. Chef Nathan Eisberg has gone from cooking crickets, ilch, to open a plant-based restaurant called Awai. The more I focus on cooking vegetables, the more I enjoy cooking in general, he said. And he's described as being a lifelong on and off vegan who has run out of excuses to eat and cook animal products. Well, that's good to hear, and hopefully more chefs will be influenced and realise that there are no excuses for using animal products to make delicious food. South African meat alternative company Fry's Family Foods is launching a coconut-based line of ice cream. The artisan product comes in five flavours, just toasted coconut, vanilla bean espresso, tonnes of cookies salted caramel and Madagascar vanilla bean. The journey at the family-owned business began around two years ago when Tammy Fry and her sister Hayley made their first pot of salted caramel from Himalayan salt and coconut sugar in their home kitchen. After several production runs and finding a partner to work with who was willing and committed to recreating the homemade feel of the ice cream on a large scale, the new line was revealed at the World Vegan Day Festival in Melbourne, Australia a few weeks ago. Now, I actually had a sneak peek the night before at a dinner hosted by our mutual friends Philip Wallen and his wife Trix at their home. Tammy, Haley, and their dad, Wally, who's the co-founder of Fry's, brought along uh, some of the ice cream to taste, and it is absolutely delicious. I loved the tons of cookies flavour particularly. It's very sweet and creamy, and I bet it's going to be a huge success. A new vegan cafe and store has opened in the inner west suburb of Petersham in Sydney, Australia, which has collaboration at its core, providing a space for several small businesses to make and sell their wares. Maker Sydney is the brainchild of Kate Jones from The Vegan Tea House and Annabelle McMillan of My Little Panda Kitchen. The venue now serves as a home for their individual businesses, as well as a host of others who share the space, including dessert makers Rhubarb Bakes, Treat Dreams and That Vegan Lady, Gelato from Over the Moo, Vegan Cosmetics from Hanami, Lasagnas by Herbisaurus and more. Jones told Broadsheet, a lot of the makers we're working with are women. There seems to be a surge of female makers. So many babes making good shit. (laughs) I love that quote. Workshops and more collaborations are on the cards, along with plans for a second cafe nearby next year, which will sell the best of Maker's products. I'm so happy to report this because I know both Kate and Annabelle and they're extremely community minded and it's lovely to see vegan business owners supporting each other like this. And I hope it gives you some ideas of how you can team up with others too. A new vegan sushi cafe is set to open in Brighton in the UK. Owner Anna MacDonald shared a post on her Facebook announcing the upcoming launch in mid-December of Happy Mackey, and that's spelled M-A-K-I, which will offer eat-in, takeaway and deliveries. MacDonald has been wowing festival goers, both vegans and non-vegans, with her Mackey rolls, whose flavours include hoisin duck and Thai sweet potatoes. 
And you can check out Happy Mackie's Facebook page or Instagram for details of the opening. Finally, the VegFest UK team have released the results of their survey of visitors to the London event at Olympia, which took place a few weeks ago in October. Around 13,500 people attended the event over the two days and 367 filled out the survey. Of this small sample, 56% extrapolated to 5,880 visitors said VegFest UK London 2016 was their first ever VegFest UK experience, while 44% extrapolated to 4,620 visitors said they'd been to other VegFest UK events before. A whopping 73% extrapolated to 7,665 visitors of respondents said that they were vegan before visiting the event. 7%, 735 visitors, were not vegan beforehand but planned to go vegan afterwards. And 10%, 1,050 visitors, were not vegan beforehand but planned to reduce their intake of animal products afterwards. Food was cited as the major reason for attending the event, followed by supporting the vegan movement and shopping. As well as food, stalls, talks and cookery demos were the most popular aspects of the festival. While the age range of attendees spread across the board, the highest numbers were 26 to 35, followed by 16 to 25, and 69% said they would definitely return next year. Just over half of those surveyed said their addiction to meat and dairy was the major obstacle in them going vegan. So that gives vegan business owners an incentive to keep coming up with amazing alternatives. You can see the full survey results on the VegFest Express blog. So this is really valuable intel and very generous of the VegFest UK team to share it freely to help organisers of other vegan events. Getting actual feedback from visitors rather than just assuming that you know what they want and why they keep coming along to your events is so important. Um, And that's the same with any business as well. You know, getting actual feedback on your products and services rather than making assumptions is really important. And this is another fantastic example of collaboration and ethical leadership by the VegFest UK team, uh, Tim Barford and Alan Lee. They've also just put together a list of vegan festivals for 2017, not just their own. And the more we can collaborate and lift each other up like this, the more we help animals, people and planet. Great stuff. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more resources, including details of my media and PR consultations, copywriting, editing and proofreading services to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business, And I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now.